from the hill country of Texas, this is One Radio Network. And a very pleasant good morning to you. This is Patrick Timpone. And you've got OneRadioNetwork.com. OneRadioNetwork.com. It is August the 14th, 2009. Lots of great shows for you every morning live at 10 a.m. Please pass on these links to everyone that you care about. And uh, also remember that everything that we do here is because of your uh, contributions. That's how we uh, make our living, basically. And so 5, 10, 20, 50, 20 bucks, whatever you have, that's what makes the whole thing works and work, rather. And you can do that anytime on One Radio Network. Dot com and all the podcasts and all the shows available at no cost worldwide through the web. Online with us this morning, gentlemen, uh, we've been uh, very interested in talking with because he has done quite a, a bit of work in, in areas that we talk a lot about on this radio network. Hormone imbalances, immune disorders, fatigue, chronic fatigue, arthritis, adrenal, thyroid. We've done shows on the, the adrenals with Dr. James, Wil- James Wilson several people on the thyroid and then also iodine something that has been coming up for us on the last oh, six months or so from several different people around the world we've all been experimenting well not all of us some of us have been experimenting with taking iodine internally as well as rubbing it on our body externally we have a gentleman who people kept saying you got to talk to Doc david brownstein he knows a lot about iodine so we're going to cover some territory here this morning and in michigan is Dr. David Brownstein, who is medical director of the Center for Holistic Medicine in Bloomfield, Michigan. He uh, has done lots of work and written many books. Uh, the, the latest, well, the last three I'll mention, Iodine, Why You Need It and Why You Can't Live Without It, uh, How to Overcome Thyroid Disorders and the Miracle of Natural Hormones. Good morning, Dr. Brownstein, and how uh, do we find you this day in August? It's a beautiful day in Michigan, and I'm happy to be here. Well, nice to have you here, sir. You've been at this for how long? A long time? I've been doing holistic medicine for about 17 years. 17 years. Was it anything in particular, Dr. Brownstein, that uh, turned you from being a more uh, contemporary MD, as we know them, into the alternative side with gradual progression? Well, I wasn't interested in anything alternative um, in my medical training. In fact, I used to tell people don't do what I tell them to do now. And then my turning point came when I was uh, practicing, you know, finished with my schooling. And my father was very ill with heart disease. And he had his first heart attack at age 40, his second heart attack shortly thereafter. And mm. he, he received some, a couple of bypass surgeries and angioplasties and was on a whole host of medications by the time I finished medical school and residency. And at that point in my career, he would, looked like he was pretty much dying. And a patient happened to give me a book that talked about some holistic principles, and I became interested in some of those ideas about heart disease, that maybe heart disease wasn't a cholesterol problem. Uh-huh. And I put my dad on two natural therapies, which was natural thyroid hormone and natural testosterone, and within seven days, his 25-year history of angina melted away, never to return. And within 30 days, his cholesterol, which was in the 350s on all these medications, went down to below 200 and stayed below 200 even when he stopped the medications. And once I saw the changes in my dad, I knew that's the type of medicine that I wanted to do for the future, and I pretty much stopped what I was doing. What a great story. What a great story. And today, isn't it fascinating that the whole cholesterol thing and heart disease is still going around, isn't it? Well, it's really something, and it's the, you know, I wrote about this in my Drugs That Don't Work and Natural Therapies That Do book, and I said it's the biggest fraud in Hmm. that's ever perpetrated on medicine hmm. and it's it's ongoing and it's going to continue to go as long as the profit motive is there um but the headlines will be in the paper at some point that uh you know oops we made a mistake and this wasn't quite the right therapy and you know we'll be on to the next one but yes sir it's really total myth and and we hear stories too dr brownstein of of people getting on cholesterol the statins and wanting to take their cholesterol down to uh, as low as 120 and 130 in that range. And are you of the, of the mind that it really needs to be a lot higher than that? Well, there's no question that studies show that cholesterol below about 150, you have an increased mortality from a whole bunch of illnesses like cancer. And 
that between a cholesterol of about 150 to 280, um, there's really no increased mortality from from illness. And uh, we call this the J curve. And so there's a spike below 150 and there's a spike above about 280. Uh-huh. Between those numbers, there's really no increased mortality. And, you know, what's little reported in the media is that 50% of people with heart attacks um, have normal cholesterol levels. So for those 50%, at least, we know for sure that cholesterol numbers are uh, not predicting anything. Um, but I can tell you for even the other 50%, I don't think they're predicting much. Dr. Bronson, you've been through the, the medical school uh, paradigm, and uh, certainly I began, I, I would assume you began your career working with uh, drug uh, company representatives and such. And what drives this, uh, uh, this, this uh, like lowering the cholesterol into the 120 and the overuse of the statins? Where do doctors get that, that kind of guidance? Well, it's, it's, it's driven by Big Pharma. And, you know, they certainly have a vested financial interest to keep as many people, um, as many people as they can and for the longest period of time on these drugs. And really, they're going to put out whatever they can put out to convince doctors and the lay people that that's what needs to be done. And I think it's, I am, uh, I uh, say it's very similar to the Wizard of Oz. Hmm. You know, he looks pretty scary up there. And until you pull the curtain aside, and, and that's what I write about in all my books, pulling the curtain aside, looking at the mechanism of how these drugs work, and then looking at the research to support or not support what Big Pharma is claiming, and um, then making your own decision on whether you think it's a valid therapy or not. And when you pull the curtain aside, the wizard doesn't look so scary, um, and it makes you think that perhaps it's not quite as uh, scary and quite as truthful as what they're telling us. And the doctors, the MDs practicing today, they they get this information, Dr. Brownstein, from uh, papers, ongoing, uh, quote, research, unquote, and and they they tend to follow it and believe it. Well, most doctors, look, most doctors want to do the right thing. Yeah. And um, and there's very few doctors that are out there to hurt people, very few. Um, So... Just because I disagree with a conventional doctor about cholesterol lowering doesn't necessarily mean that I'm right and he's wrong, or vice versa. Yes, sir. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with disagreement. What I try and write in my book is uh, to explain to people how these drugs work, support it with the literature, and then let make let let people make a decision on you know what they think about this. And you know, doctors are taught a certain way. You know, we're taught basically what the people above us were taught and it's a hierarchy, and you're basically taught not to move outside of that hierarchy and to keep doing what was done before you. I see. And uh, this has been done for hundreds, if not thousands, of years in medicine. And, um, you know, uh, clearly in our healthcare crisis that we're in now, we need to do things different, and we need to look at a different paradigm because the paradigm we've been working in clearly does not work. Mm. Uh, do docs, uh, the MDs, uh, have a... A uh, standard uh, practice, kind of standard practice of care thing that they must follow, or, or do you all get into any uh, uh, trouble? Not trouble, but uh, sticky places when you start doing things differently from what you're taught. Well, sure, there's state boards that license us and that hold us accountable to the standard of care. Mm, standard problem, of care. The problem we run into is if you don't believe the standard of care is valid, right? Then you're against the grain of the powers that be, mm-hmm. and sure. There's doctors that lose their licenses and run into legal problems all the time on this. Mm-hmm. Do you still use uh, any kind of pharmaceutical meds to Dr. Brownstein in your business? Of course I do. There's, do you? There's a time and a place for everything, and pharmaceutical medications have their place. Um, now, as, as far as certain drugs, like statin drugs, I don't think they have their place for anybody because mm. um, I don't believe in their mechanism of action. And um, But other drugs, antibiotics... Um, um, some people need antacid drugs, although the vast majority of people don't. But some people need those if you have a bleeding ulcer, you know, to to control the acid production for a short period of time. You know, things like that. I, I prescribe drugs all the time, but I try and prescribe them for the shortest period of time and try and use natural therapies to lessen the course of the drug and to help the body heal. Mm-hmm. Dr. David Brownstein is with us. My name is Patrick Timpone. Uh, lots of different books, a guide to a dairy-free diet, a guide to a gluten-free diet, a guide to healthy eating, and a sultry way to health. 
and overcoming arthritis. And uh, we're going to be talking about iodine here this morning that we're excited to talk about. But I want to kick around some ideas on the thyroid. It seems like it's uh, it's virtually an epidemic kind of an idea of hypothyroidism. What is your uh, theories and, and uh, your research showing you why so many people have thyroids that are, say, mostly underactive, but then also overactive? Well, there's no question that thyroid illnesses are occurring at epidemic rates across the United States, north to south, east to west. And, you know, I wrote in my book, Overcoming Thyroid Disorders, why this is occurring. And, and, and you know, there are many reasons for this, nutritional deficiencies, hormonal deficiencies, tox- toxicities that are increased in our bodies, hmm. um, and, you know, the the... The conventional blood tests are also missing the diagnosis in these cases. And, you know, really a holistic approach is the best approach to diagnosing and treating thyroid problems. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of, of, can we say, modern living with the stress, the toxicity, the uh, the uh, uh, other than the best diet at all kind of a perfect storm and then the thyroid doesn't do what it needs to do? Absolutely. And and what, what does the thyroid do? Why... Why, I mean, what kind of things, what is the mechanism of the thyroid? Does it produce hormones, Dr. Bronstein? So the thyroid sits in the lower part of our neck and it weighs about 1.5 ounces and it produces a teaspoon of thyroid hormone for a whole year. A teaspoon that, a year? That teaspoon for the whole year has to regulate the metabolic rate of each and every one of the trillions of cells in our bodies 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, hmm. 365 days of the year. And... Um, the little variations in that thyroid hormone will have big effects in the body. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I've written in and I've lectured all over the place about this. And, you know, my comment to physicians when I lecture is if the thyroid is not properly functioning, there's no way you can get anything else regulated in the body. So it's vitally important to ensure an optimally functioning thyroid gland, um, for every patient in every condition. That they're dealing with. Do, do you find the, the blood test, Dr. Brownstein, the TA, TSH levels that uh, we normally use, do you feel they're accurate? Well, I do feel they're accurate, and I do feel they're useful, and I do draw them in my patients, but I think patients are more than TSH levels. And um, I think that, you know, in medical school, we're taught basically to draw the TSH, and if that's abnormal, treat them. If it's not, send them on their way and tell them it's not a thyroid problem, and I think that's the wrong approach. I think the TSH can give you information, but it can also mislead you. And there are other thyroid blood tests that need to be drawn, such as T4 and T3 levels and reverse T3 and thyroid antibody levels, as well as doing a physical exam, taking a history, and checking a patient's basal body temperature. Mm. And then you kind of put the whole picture together and you'll get a much better picture of what's going on with the thyroid than just a TSH test. I see. Can we, do we get a good idea if the basal, it is it called the Barnes, is, is that what it is? The Broda Barnes study uh, idea in the morning. If, if that's low, what is it, the 70, 70, uh, what is it? Uh, let's see. Uh, 87.8. Oh, 87.8, sorry. Yeah, 87.8. But if it's below that over three or four days, can we, or we can't be assured that we have an underactive, or do do you still do the TSH levels? So Dr. Barnes was a doctor from the 1930s to about the 1970s. Uh-huh. And he wrote some books and articles that he felt that following the basal body temperature of his patients was a good measure of thyroid function. But Dr. Barnes also did blood tests. And, um, I, you know, I, I, just, I write about this in my book. I have patients do basal body temperatures, but I also do blood tests and take a history and do a physical exam, and you need to correlate it all together. The patients are more than just a test. They're more than just a temperature. Yeah. Uh, so a low temperature does, may point to a thyroid problem. It can point to other problems as well. But it's not, you're not treating a low temperature. You're treating a patient, a human being. Is there... Boy, and that's really the key, isn't it? Is there a, a, um, a challenge if the person has adrenals that are not up to snuff? And that's also a lot of that going around. But to get the adrenals working before the thyroid, or how do you do that? Absolutely. Um, the adrenals are another set of endocrine glands near the kidneys 
they work in concert with the thyroid to keep the body's metabolic balance. And I sort of liken it to a teeter-totter. Mm. And that teeter-totter needs to be balanced with the adrenals on one side and the thyroid on the other side. When one, when one or the other is off balance, it creates big problems in the body. There's no question that if there's an adrenal problem, that has to be rectified first before dealing with a thyroid problem, or you could make the adrenal problem worse by just giving them thyroid hormone. Now, the adrenal, is the, uh, if I understand, it's the fight or flight idea, and then so when we worry or get angst or, or overreact to stress and that... Uh, that makes that uh, gland work over time, and then they get weak. Is that sort of accurate? So signs of low adrenal function include tiredness, low blood pressure, brain fog, um, dry skin, coldness, um, inability to exercise, or you feel worse after you exercise. Hmm. You can't tolerate temperature changes very well from hot to cold or cold to hot. Um, people generally don't sweat who have low adrenals, you know, a whole host of problems. But these are can be very similar to thyroid problems as well. Hmm. That's why I sort of liken it to that teeter-totter analogy. So if you're working with someone with the with an adrenal that you've uh, determined, diagnosed they have low adrenal or adrenal fatigue, what, or, do you uh, have favorite uh, supplementations that our listeners can uh, should consider and maybe bring up to their doctors? Well, they need to work with a health care practitioner knowledgeable in um, um, bioidentical hormones to get the best results, I believe. Huh. But some of the things that they can check on are DHEA levels and pregnenolone levels. Those are both adrenal hormones. And in my book, The Miracle of Natural Hormones, I give normal ranges and how to check these levels and how to supplement people for these things. Um other hormones that can be helpful for adrenal problems include natural hydrocortisone, growth hormone, natural testosterone, natural progesterone. These are all produced, besides growth hormone, in the adrenal glands and can help regulate the adrenal glands. And again, I go through these in depth in my book. Uh-huh. Uh, so it, it sounds like it's more, it's, it's as much of a hormone issue, Dr. Brownstein, rather than just giving somebody, say, uh, desiccated uh, adrenal, like a standard process or something, it's more complicated than that? It's, it's, I do believe it's more complicated. Now, I do use glandulars, uh-huh. um, and glandulars can be very helpful, but for those people with chronic illness, um, I think it is more complicated than just taking a glandular product. And, um, you know, everyone needs to have things optimized for their individual biochemical type. And... That's where working with a healthcare practitioner, practitioner knowledgeable about these things can really help. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you hear tell a lot of people, we get emails and calls on the show quite often that uh, uh, the, their healthcare person will simply just go to uh, a glandular and then give them that. And uh, many of them don't have all that good results. I use glandulars, and glandulars can be very helpful, but for many people, it's not enough. You know, they are toxic with bromide fluoride or mercury or acidic or and they need to be detoxed to help those adrenals work better um vitamin c is very important for the adrenal glands to function normally um you know there's a whole host of things that can help for adrenal problems yeah let's talk about uh, uh, uh iodine a bit this morning uh you you wrote a whole book on it so obviously there's something going on here about how your body uh what was the name of the book? Uh, let's see. Over uh, wh- iodine. Why you need it, and why you can't live without it. Does the body, in a in a perfect uh, scenario, Doctor Brownstein, make the amount of iodine it needs generally? The body doesn't manufacture iodine. Iodine can only be uh, iodine is an essential element and it must be taken in from the diet. Um, so we are dependent on our food sources for iodine or supplementing, and book that you gave the title for. It's in its fourth edition right now. Mm-hmm. And out of all the things that I've seen in 17 years of holistic medicine, there's not been one single item that has more bang for the buck than iodine. Really? And that's by far compared to anything else. And I would say that includes any conventional pharmacology as well. Mm-hmm. Um, iodine deficiency is rampant in our society. 
iodine levels have fallen 50% across the United States in the last 30 years. And during those last 30 years when iodine levels have fallen, you've seen epidemic rates of thyroid problems from hypothyroidism to autoimmune thyroid problems, Hashimoto's and Graves' disease, to thyroid cancer occur. You've seen epidemic rates of breast cancer, prostate cancer, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, um, all which I think are all related to iodine deficiency plus other illnesses. Um, so I think it's a it's a substance that's intrigued me for 17 years. And you know, once I became educated about iodine and started testing people and seeing 96 over 96 percent of my patients severely deficient in iodine, and seeing the results I've had in them when I've corrected their iodine deficiency. Um, you know, I began to write the books and began to really promote this awareness. And, and what kind of tests do you, do you do with your patients to determine if they're low in iodine? Um, I think you mentioned at the beginning about, uh, you know, rubbing iodine on your skin. Like the Lugols or something like that? You can rub iodine on the skin. That's an old test where you look and see how long it takes for the color, yeah. the brown color of iodine to go away. And it's reported that if it goes away within 24 hours, you're iodine deficient. If it stays, you're not. That's what we've that's heard, real, yes. That's a really poor test. Is it really? And 88% of the iodine can uh, vaporize hmm. from the skin and just become a gas and, and go into the atmosphere. Um, about 20% of the body's iodine stores are in the skin. So I don't know if you're measuring iodine in the skin by doing that test. I don't know if... You're measuring how quickly it turns into vapor and comes off the skin, and mm-hmm. you know, but it's certainly not measuring the body iodine load. Mm-hmm. So my suggestion is either the the easiest way and the most accepted way to do iodine levels is urinary iodine levels and looking for iodine excretion, and then you can calculate how much people are taking in and how much they might need. And there's a test called an iodine loading test, which we do in our office, where we give a certain amount of iodine see how much you urinate out over 24 hours, and then do some calculations and figure out you know, when your body has reached iodine sufficiency from that. And that's all described in my book. Well. So much like we, we might do with the mercury loading test is it with the urine, 24-hour urine. Very similar. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So uh, uh, that notwithstanding, is, is it uh, safe for folks to rub like the 5% Lugols on their skin or, or take some of the iodines? Uh, we've talked about nascent, N-A-S-C-E-N-T, internally. Is, is that safe? Well, look, is the, the best result is to work with somebody knowledgeable about, about this, get your levels checked before you start, and then check your levels afterwards. Mm-hmm. Having said that, um, iodine's been around since the beginning of time. Um, it's been used in medicine since the early 1800s, and the vast majority of people that have been using <clears throat> iodine over the last 200 years have not been checking their levels. They've just been using it. Mm-hmm. So it is a pretty safe substance, but my suggestion is to work with a healthcare practitioner and don't just take it alone. Mm-hmm. Um, iodine, you can rub it on your skin. You can take it internally. I mean, there are many ways to get iodine in the body. Um, I generally recommend people ingesting it. Um, the absorption of iodine is pretty darn good. Um, we've done some studies with that um, through the orally. It's not as good through the skin as it is as it is orally. What are your favorite brands uh, orally? Well, um, in today's toxic world, with our increasing exposure to bromide and fluoride, the amount of iodine in something like nascent iodine, I don't think is enough. Really, for people, that's been clear from my testing. And um, people need large amounts of iodine, such as in Lugols or Iodorol, which is tableted Lugols, or Iodozyme HP, which is, again, a tableted uh, Lugols. And those are in milligram doses, and, you know, I found those to be the, the best products on the market. Iodorol, we've heard of that one. And uh, what's, a, what's a kind of a standard dose that you start with with people? Well, everyone's different, but mm-hmm. generally from 6 to 50 milligrams per day. Um, sometimes if people have breast, prostate cancer, breast cancer, you know, cr- severe chronic illnesses, I'll sometimes titrate their doses up to more than that, but that's the minority. Mm-hmm. Most people between 6 to 50 milligrams per day. Mm-hmm. 
And why is the iodorol and the other two you mentioned different from, from the nascent? Is it just uh, stronger? Or are you just getting... iodine is in very tiny microgram amounts. I see. It's just not potent enough mm-hmm. for the, the world we live in today, mm-hmm. in my experience. Mm-hmm. So do we, are we depleting our iodine? You say the world we live in today. Can, we, can I assume by that statement that uh, the toxicity and uh, chemicals and whatever, all the things we mentioned, that depletes the body of iodine, Dr. Brownstein? The pesticides and the insecticides are all filled with fluoride and bromide, which are chemicals that can inhibit and cause the body to release iodine. Um, it's in our fruit and vegetable supply. It's in our bread products, it's mm. in pastries, it's in cakes and cookies, and it's in automobiles, it's in computers, it's in mattresses and furniture and baby furniture. I mean, it's just tremendous what, My goodness. what's going on. And our toxicity has gone up markedly. The amount of bromine in breast milk has gone up tenfold over the last ten year, uh, in the last ten years, according to the EPA. Um, you know, that's just one marker that you know it's a sign that our toxicity has gone up, and therefore our iodine requirements have gone up during that same time. And you said it's, it's the bromine and what else, sir? Bromine and fluoride and chlorine. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And pesticides and insecticides. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so then the weekend, is that a link also, uh, Dr. Bronstein, to the uh, to the thyroid uh, epidemic you talked about? No question. Okay. Wow. I'll be done. So where did we humans, where do, would we get these uh, this iodine uh, from natural sources, food sources, uh, the way, say, God would uh, set that up before all well, these assaults? The, the really, the only true source of iodine is sea vegetables and uh, seafood. Um, and the problem is that the sea vegetables, the longer they've been out of the ocean, the more iodine that sublimates out into a gaseous state and leaves the product. Also, if the sea vegetables aren't harvested from a clean area of the ocean, mm-hmm. sea vegetables will pick up the bromides and fluorides and chlorine-containing products and lose their iodine. Um, for fish, the problems with fish are mercury and, you know, the sure. uh, same thing. It's the same problem. But, you know, the longer the fish is out of the ocean, the less iodine that you're going to get from that fish. Um, so, again, I, I just don't think that it's feasible to get it from sea vegetables and seafood unless you're going to eat a tremendous amount of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you and have that, I guess... And then you have the the mercury issues if you start really pounding down a lot of the seafood, maybe. That's correct. So, how about these sea salts? They're you know they're real big in the natural food community. You know everybody's got their their sacred sea salt that they eat, whether or not it's I don't know. You know them all. Uh, do, do does that uh, do those salts? Some of them, or all of them, or any of them uh, supply this iodine? Well, you know, I wrote a book on salt. Yeah, I know you I- did. Yeah. I described some analyses of salts, different salts in there, and the, the sea salts, the unrefined sea salts are the best salts to use, there's no question, there's more minerals, there's less toxicities than the refined, uh, you know, iodized salt, but on the other side, there's no iodine, or very little amounts of iodine in them, and if you use those salts, you certainly need to supplement with iodine on top of that. We've had a bit of a uh, interesting little, I don't know if you want to call it a controversy, but uh, we've uh, had some shows with Dr. Hal Huggins. Are you familiar with Dr. Huggins? I am. And he's doing quite a bit of work with doing uh, blood tests, and he, he says he has over 300,000 data points that he's gathered over the years and worked uh, with the work of Dr. Murray. And he contends that the best salt to use is the Morton's pickling and canning salt because it's just pure sodium chloride. And he his people get better numbers with their blood test after they're on that for a couple weeks than using sea salts. Well, I can tell you my experience has been unrefined Celtic sea salt. I've had it analyzed four times. Mm -hmm. It's been clean of heavy metals. Um, Salt is more than just sodium and chloride. Salt is, as, as our maker gave to us, salt is a substance with over 80 minerals in it. Mm -hmm. Um, It's, It's got energy and vitality to it. Um, Refined salt has no energy, no vitality to it. It's a devitalized substance. Mm -hmm. And um, people do significantly better with getting right forms of salt in their diet, as I wrote about in my book. So I I would 
respectfully disagree with sure. you on that. And, and then I guess it certainly depends on, on how these salts are brought to market. Uh, some suggest that the solar drying of these salts are give them more life force or prana, as you suggested. Do you have any evidence to that? I don't have any evidence of that, but I can tell you that um, the salts that I tested in my book that are free of heavy metals, um, I, I think were good salts, and um, I don't have any evidence of that, but there is some new evidence that's come out that the sun drying of salt leaves a matrix in it of minerals that I'm going to publish in a, in a uh, new book, oh, uh, hopefully by the end of this year. Um, so let's leave it at that. So there may be something to the solar drying. There are actually, I think there is something to the solar okay. drying. Can you mention a couple of the other ones for our listeners of, of the salts that tested uh, clean? Uh, you mentioned the... <clears throat> I tested Celtic salt. Uh-huh. I tested Redmond salt. And I tested uh, um, Himalayan salt. They oh. all tested clean. Of mercury. Heavy metals. Heavy metals, yeah. Toxicity. Other toxicities. Uh-huh. The, the Redmond and the uh, Himalayan. Yeah, those are those are certainly some uh, that we know. Um, is uh, the work with that you do with hormones? I mean, that's such a you know a curious field, especially for the ladies. I mean, you you've heard the stories. Um, in general, with the right uh, skill set, do you think that? Uh, uh, natural uh, healthcare people can uh, find a combination of these natural hormones and to get the ladies uh, and the guys to uh, on on the right track. I mean, is that is the technology there? Yeah, of course, technology is there. Technology is there with the proper healthcare provider and the proper testing and a proper physical exam and proper history, and it's certainly there. And you know, I've been. I've been at this for 17 years and seeing the results, you know, day after day in my practice. Mm-hmm. What Do you use saliva testing where maybe you take your spit for, what, four, five, six times during the day? Do you, Is that one of your tools? You can use saliva testing. You can use serum testing. You can use urine testing. And each each method has its has opponents and each method has its proponents. And I generally use serum testing with occasional saliva testing. And... I have friends who use saliva testing tell me they get wonderful results with it. I don't think it really matters which mode of testing you're using as long as people are properly followed with a history and a physical and the appropriate pre and post lab test. Mm -hmm. And I think you can certainly, I have found serum testing clinically correlates with how the vast majority of people are doing. Do you use a lot of these where they're, they're made from like the wild yam? I guess that's one of the more popular ones. I use bioidentical hormones, which have the same chemical structure of our own hormones. They're made from plant products. Yams is one source of them. So, yes, that's what I've been using for the last 17 years. And the transdermal, is that where you rub them on your skin? That's correct. Mm-hmm. What, what are some of the... Uh, is soy as dangerous a food as we hear about for the, harm, uh, for the uh, hormones and, and the, uh, the, the phyto uh, or the... Uh, uh, what's the term for that? What's in those? Uh, uh, estrogens. Yeah, the phytoestrogens yeah. and the xenoestrogens in the in the plastics. Is that true? I think there's a lot of problems with unrefined, uh, with non-fermented soy, hmm. such as soy milk and soy dogs and soy cheese. Um, and I do think that the the that type of soy and the soy protein isolate needs to be avoided. Mm-hmm. And my experience has been that people who ingest a lot of that have significantly more thyroid problems than people who don't. Mm-hmm. That doesn't include the fermented forms of soy like miso and tempeh. You have your website is drbrownstein.com. What kind of things will my uh, listeners find there when they go searching? Well, it's, it's drbrownstein.com. drbrownstein, yes. Period. And, you know, I have, I have, you know, a hormone quiz, and I've got some information, and I write a blog, which I update about two to three times a week on, mm-hmm. you know, recent topics. And, um, you know, I think there's a whole bunch of information that they'll find, and, you know, hopefully to help educate them on, you know, how they can make the best health care decisions for themselves because I'm all about empowering people to make their own choices, not to blindly follow along, whether it's a holistic practitioner or whether it's a conventional practitioner. Yeah. You need to have the knowledge at your fingertips and then make your then you can make a better decision for yourself and for your family. And I I suppose all the books Dr. Bronstein are available there folks can order on, on your website or do they Absolutely. need to go other places? 
I have nine books. They're all available on my website. I have DVDs of my lectures. Um, the books came out, and the first one came out in 1997, and they've all been updated usually within the last year or two. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't changed the price on the books in over 10 years. Um, they're $15 each, and, um, um, you know, I really enjoy writing, and I, I write a national newsletter now, um, which I've enjoyed with, and, you know, I would tell your readers, if they're interested more, come to my website, sign up for my blog, you know, see what yeah, I have to say. Sure. Well, I'm going to sign through. up for the blog and keep in touch with you. Before we leave, you, I, this is certainly a current topic with the healthcare thing, and, uh, all this going on in the world, in the world of healthcare, and especially here in the United States that we're most familiar with. And then you, so throughout our, our, our chat this morning, Dr. Brownstein, you, you really laid the, the groundwork of, 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 you know, this term holistic, taking it to what it really means, right? What it really means, and not just uh, saying that the patient is, uh, is this test or that test, but really talking to them. How do you manage, that, how do you manage to, to take the time to do that and to make the whole thing work financially. It seems like a lot of docs, uh, you know, talk about not being able to do that. Um, and I don't know if I've been asked that question before. Um, I have never made a medical decision based on finances. I never, when I saw the changes in my dad, I never decided I'm going to do holistic medicine because I want to make money. Mm-hmm. Actually, the opposite occurred. When I decided I couldn't do conventional medicine because I didn't believe in it anymore, um, I remember my father asking me a hundred times over, "Are you sure you want to do this? How are you going to make a living? You know, hmm. people are people going to come see you? You know, you're not doing what everybody else is doing out there." And I had to go where my convictions lied, and I pretty much followed that pathway. Um, I have never worried about money and I still don't worry about money and look I'm making a good living I make more than my father ever made I'm very happy I love what I do I wouldn't want to do anything else um, and I'm not turning away the money but I don't worry about it and it seems to do okay with me and how do you what would I tell other practitioners I would just say that if you if you have the convictions and you have the belief in what you're doing whatever it is you'll do a better job and people will be interested in, you know, your thoughts on this. And that's what I found with my writings, and that's why I've, I've been, been passionate about this. Can we say kind of a basic concept, if you do the right thing, you you help people the best you can, that it, it somehow works? I think it comes back to you in many different ways, mm-hmm. and um, it certainly energizes me about my work, and you know, I feel blessed and lucky every day that I can get paid for doing what I do, and it, I find it uh, humbling that patients come back to see me and humbling that they'll pay for what I do and you know I'm truly a blessed person for it and, oh, uh, well. oh, uh, good for you what do you think about this this healthcare uh, thing that's going on in the country right now are you encouraged by anything that you hear well what do I think I think that uh, I think it's the wrong plan I think it's a Sick care plan is not a health care plan, and that's where it's that's where it's an incorrect plan. However, clearly the system is broken. Clearly, it needs to be fixed. And I do give President Obama credit for trying something. Now, I don't agree with what he's trying to do, mm-hmm. but um, I have to give him credit for trying. And um, if we don't change things, you know, we're, we're going to we're, we're basically driving off a. You know, I feel like uh, I feel like it's a part of a healthcare team in this country that we're all on the board of the Titanic, just moving the lounge chairs around. Mm-hmm. And it's already hit the iceberg; it's going down. And so clearly, we need to do something different. But I, I just don't think the the different ideas are in this plan. And um, you know, he certainly didn't sell it to the American people. And you know, it, it's probably doomed for failure. And I, on the other side, I think that the rhetoric against it, the death squads and things like that, sure. is ridiculous. And you know, that's not there, and that would not be there, and, you know, that's not what it's about. But, you know, until we until we unsnare ourselves from the tentacles of big pharma, we're, we're not going to have any meaningful health care reform, and that's where the problems, in my mind, result, reside primarily. And um, I hope somebody will be able to tackle it in the future. Mm-hmm. Well, it really does is a, is a calling card for 
for all of us uh, to to take total, absolute responsibility for our health, huh? And and, uh, and uh, really, really dig in and see what works and what doesn't work. Well, Dr. Bronstein, it's been an honor to have you here, and uh, I, I appreciate uh, your work. And uh, we're going to check in with your blog and your website. And uh, I want to get the iodine book. Check that out, and we'll uh, we'll keep in touch with you, sir. Thanks for your time this morning. We appreciate Thank you for it. Having me. Been an honor. Thank you. Dr. Bye-bye. David Brownstein, he is in uh, Michigan. And it sounds like he's got some interesting books. I, I certainly like the way uh, he talked about uh, his subjects. And uh, it sure made sense to me. And I wish he was here in the Central Texas area. I'd go see him and learn a thing or three. His website is Dr. Brownstein. Dr. Brownstein. That's B R O W N S T E I N. Dot com about nine books as he said he does a blog and you can check that out so this is some more information for you more tools for your tool chest to take care of yourself and we're here to support you do that to do that at 24 7 where you can check in with now over 500 interviews that we've done with folks on health wealth and well-being where we cover the money angle and uh, some other curious things like even earth changes prophecy a lot of things on health so please pass on this website to everyone that you care about and all your friends and family and pass on the links to our our interviews like this one with dr david brownstein because you're not going to get this information anywhere else the kinds of questions we ask and uh, the depth that we go into and that's why uh, we have so many people around the world that uh, that listen to us and it's an honor for us to be in your life each and every morning at 10 a.m central time and then we have lots of special shows like dr brownstein that we have on the website at no cost and your uh contributions are always uh, well appreciated and well used five ten tony bucks whatever you can anytime by just going through paypal using a credit card you don't have to be a member and you're good to go i love you all very much and i will see you next time around this is patrick tim pone take care